name is Dustin Miller. I have the honor of filling in for Coach Bush tonight. Uh, he has some soccer stuff going on. I see some new faces. I know that students are beginning to move back, move in. School's about to start, um, which is unreal. I have three kids. They're all about to start school, and it blows my mind. I feel like summer just started, and yet I am 100% ready for them to be in school. Um, I think they're ready, too. Our house is a little crazy with an eight, six, and three-year-old. Uh, we are done. People ask us a lot if we're done having kids. We are for sure done. I am not. I've been to the Bush's house. Uh, I've seen what it's like to have five kids, and uh, we are not called to do that. So we are not grace for five. We are grace for three, and they are awesome. Um, so, but no, I'm, I'm super honored that Bush would ask me to, to fill in for him. Uh, my wife and I spent five years on staff here at God's Church. Moved here from St. Louis to, to take a staff position here. Uh, love this church. Love serving in this church. And uh, am honored to be a part of Sub 30. Have been honored to be a part of it from the beginning. Uh, we were the high school directors and built a team of leaders over there that then became kind of the charging force to uh, Sub 30. And so I love you guys. I love this ministry. I love young people. Um, I say that I just turned 33 on Tuesday and I felt it. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been 33 for almost a week and I feel it. Like I woke up sore. I was like, I know Jesus died at 33. I, don't, I you know, now believe that for myself. I feel like I'm dying. But uh, I woke up, my back hurts. Like, I didn't get whipped, but it for sure hurts. Like, it kind of felt like it. So um, my son wrote, my oldest son is a huge basketball fan. He wrote in my card that it was my Pippin year because Scotty Pippin was 33. So I'm going to receive that, my Scotty Pippin year um, or my Jesus year, whatever you want to call it. So tonight I am talking about identity. I'm very excited about it. Literally, I, every, anytime, Coach Bush and I talk about this a lot, anytime we get the opportunity to speak to you guys, we take it very seriously. Um, we don't just regurgitate something that we've heard. We want to hear a fresh word from God whenever we take this stage. We consider this an honor for Pastor Bill to allow us to do this. And so um, I always want a fresh word for you guys whenever I speak. He asked me to speak uh, almost a week ago. He almost gave me a week's notice. And so, man, I prayed and asked God for a fresh word. And literally, he woke me up this morning with a word. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, I'm ready to get into it, but I'm going to pray really quick, and then, we'll, and then we'll get started. Father God, we love you, and we praise you. God, we thank you for the opportunity to just get into your word, to learn from you. God, I ask that you would speak to our hearts, allow this word to take root in us and to bear fruit in our lives. God, I praise you and thank you for every single young person in this room. God, I ask that you I, I just bless their families, bless their lives right now. I thank you that they have ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive what you want us to to receive, God, as we look to your word and as we see the reflection of ourselves in your word, God, as we are able to find our identity in you, Lord, I thank you that you allow that to sink deep into our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said amen. So I want to talk about identity, and I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to a story about Jesus in Matthew 3, um, but the, one of the, I think the reason this is such a big deal to me is because it's something that I wish I would have heard when I was 20, 21, 22. How many of you guys, I'm going to call some of you guys out, how many of you guys are in a relationship right now? Some of you all in a, in a dating, some of you guys like, they're here, so you're like kind of, I don't, I, we haven't defined it yet. Some of you guys are just here scoping and hoping, like you, you, know, you invited somebody, hoping maybe, maybe it's going to work out, you know what I'm saying? You're like writing their name down like Bush did. Um, it could work out for you, but... The, the reason I ask that is because as we begin to talk about identity and insecurity tonight, I want you to think about that. I think about that a lot. My wife and I love talking to young people and love especially working on relationships with young people. We, my wife uh, was married at 18, widowed at 21. We got married at 23, had kids at 24, 26, and 29. We were very young when all of that kind of happened. How many of you guys are like in those ranges, like 23 to 20? Seven. Anybody, anybody in here over that? Okay, okay. Yeah, I was like married with kids, which is unbelievable because I don't even think I'm capable to raise kids right now. And so it's like unreal to think that that was a decade ago. But we have such a heart for it because I, I wish these are things that I would have known. Because a lot of times we go into a relationship thinking that like it's going to complete some part of us. But I, when I talk about Adam and Eve, I talk a lot about how Eve was a compliment to Adam, not the completion of him. Like your spouse, that person that you date, that person that you find that you want to spend forever with should be a compliment to you, to your personality. My wife compliments me well, but she does not complete me. I am made whole. I am a whole man of God outside of my relationship with my wife. Do we make each other better? Absolutely. Are we stronger because we're together? Yes. 
But I, I had to learn that later. I had to learn that after we were already together, after we were already married, I had to figure out, okay, there's parts of me that are missing that I expected her to fulfill and that I expected her to complete. And it doesn't work like that. I can't put that on her. And so if you're in a relationship, hoping to get in a relationship at any point in time, if you're not trying to be poor and be single forever, this is a message for you. I want you to think about this, that, that I need to be whole and complete, lacking nothing before I step into that relationship. And if you're already in one, allow yourself to begin to develop these habits and skills now and be confident in who you are. A relationship is not going to fix you. It's not going to make you feel more secure or more confident or more loved. It's only going, it's, it's like a relationship is like money. It just pulls out more of who you are. It just exposes parts of you that maybe you didn't even know were there or maybe you didn't know were as serious as you thought. Your relationship will expose you. Your relationship with others will expose you. And insecurity breeds infidelity. Insecurity breeds infidelity. I'm insecure, I, so I don't want to let you in, so I'm going to put walls up, and I'm going to push myself away from you. I don't feel like I can receive love, or I don't feel like you're fulfilling those needs for me, so I've got to go seek it elsewhere. This is in our relationship with God. This is in our relationship with others. This is in our, in our dating relationships. Insecurity breeds infidelity, and it's not just on the part of I've got to push myself away, but also people who are insecure won't allow people in, so you begin to build these walls up. And you begin to get close to somebody, and then you say, okay, I don't, want, I don't want to let you in on that part of me. And you begin to push them away, and then you wonder why there's distance between you and why you can't get close to anybody. But it's because you haven't dealt with what's going on on the inside of you. We need to deal with what's in our hearts. We need to deal with ourselves and become whole and complete in and of ourselves with our relationship with God before we begin to dive into a relationship. Many of us tend to also project our opinion of ourselves on God. I know I'm, I'm diving deep kind of fast here, but we, we project the opinion of ourselves on God where it's like, I don't feel worthy, so I don't believe that God thinks that I'm worthy. Or, I, I don't feel lovable, and so I don't believe that I can approach God the way that other people can. Or, I don't believe that I can receive that God will do for me what he'll do for others because I don't feel secure. I don't feel worthy. I'm not confident in what I've done or in my, in my time with him or our relationship with him. So that's fine for Bush and that's fine for, for Rachel and that's fine for them because they've grown up in the church or they've been around it or they've done ministry or they've spent the time or, or they, they, like, they, they have, they're disciplined. They read the word. They pray. And so that's great for them, but I don't believe I can receive that. I don't believe that I'm there yet. And we begin to project that insecurity on God, and then, it, and then it skews our relationship. Or maybe we have a broken relationship with a parent, and we begin to project that on God, where it's like, well, this is how my father spoke to me, and this is how my father treated me, and so that's how I view God speaking to me. I remember I did an exercise with um, a counselor one time, and, and they, we sat down, and, and he said, hey, I want you to sit down and close your eyes and imagine that you are like having coffee with Jesus. Like Jesus walks in the room and he sits down at the table and you look at him in the eyes. What does he look like? What, what does his facial expression say to you? And I was like, he's disappointed. And he's like, you really, you really believe that? Do you really believe that Jesus is disappointed in you? And I was like, I mean, I know his word and I know what his word says and, I, and, I, and this isn't in my notes, by the way, so this is for somebody, but I'm like, I... I know what his word says, but I also know how I feel. And he's like, okay, pull your feelings aside. Like, put your feeling of yourself aside. Put what you believe about you aside. Put your disappointment in yourself or in your situation or where you're at in life or what somebody did to you or what you thought about somebody or what you did. Put that all aside and allow Jesus to look at you the way he would see you through his word, through who he is in his heart. Now what does that look like? That's how we need to begin to envision God looking at us. Man, God loves you. You're his child. We're going to get into that. I'm getting ahead of myself. You don't have to come crawling back to God. Many of us believe that God sees us the way that we see us, and it's not true. I give this example a lot. You may have heard me say this before, but when I come home from work, I said I have three kids. When I come home from work, my kids are running around. They're nuts. My, my boys are shooting each other in the face with Nerf guns, and Noah's like, I don't know, half naked, running in the mud and like throwing chalk at her brothers. And she's tough, so she beats them up and they're all crying. Like it's, it's nuts and it's a blast. But when I get home and my kids are busy and distracted, I'm not like angry with them for not running up to me and saying daddy and jumping in my arms. I will sit and I will, I will chill and I will allow them to do them and have fun and be them and when they come to me, when they come and, like, jump on my lap and are excited to see me and want to spend time with me, 
I just savor that moment. Like, I'm just glad that they're there. I'm just excited that they want to spend time with me, that they want to be with me. And I'm not the father that God is. I want you to know that God isn't upset whenever you come back to him. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, those who are weary. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus is waiting to give you that rest. Jesus is our Sabbath. So Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus is the Sabbath for us. Jesus is where we find our rest. Jesus is where we can finally step back and take a breath and say, God, I, I need a break from this right now. I'm going to cast my cares on you and my burdens on you. And Jesus, following this, Jesus said, take up my yoke because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He wants us to come to him. That word, come to me, is diete in the Greek, and it's, it's come quickly. It's exclamated, come quickly to me. Jesus is saying, I want you now. I don't need you to crawl back. I don't need you to take your time. I don't need you to feel sorry for yourself. I don't need you to think that I'm upset for you. I just need you to come to me. And when you do, I have so many things that I want to give you. I want to bless you. I want to show you how much that I love you. I want to I give you my yoke and my burden because it's so much lighter than what you're trying to carry on your own. Allow me to carry this with you. All right, let's get in the word. You guys want to? Matthew 3. Let's go to Matthew 3. We're going to start in verse 13. So this is, so this story is in Matthew 3. It's in Mark 1. It's in John 3. And it's in Luke 1. So this is like right at the beginning of Jesus' life. I think Matthew told the story best, so that's what I'm going to read it out of. And he goes on. I want to continue on in, in chapter 4. But this, this verse, this passage of Scripture happens before Jesus has entered his ministry. So Jesus, all we know about Jesus now is that he was born, that John the Baptist is his cousin and prepared the way for him, that when he was 12, he went to the temple and everyone was amazed at how wise he was, and now he's 30 years old. That's all we know. That's all we know about Jesus. And here it is. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. This is his cousin, John the Baptist. It says, but John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? I think this is really interesting because John talked a lot about his baptism versus the baptism of Jesus. John's baptism was the baptism of repentance. That's what he, that's what he offered people. He said, hey, when I baptize you, that is you saying, I repent of my sins, I die to myself, and I come back alive, and now I'm made clean, now I'm made free. Like that's the baptism that John offered. And Jesus comes to him, having never sinned, and says, hey, I want you to baptize me and the baptism of repentance. Why? Because I want to I want to relate to my people and show them who I am. Show them that I am I am repenting on behalf of these people. And John says, "What are you doing here? I should be baptizing you." But Jesus said, "It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires." So John agreed to baptize him, and after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. Another translation says, I won't mention the translation because Pastor Bill really, really went after it on Sunday. But uh, he's, another translation says, And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. My Son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. I want to camp here for a second. God loved, validated, and affirmed Jesus before he did anything. Like the Jesus that we know and love, all the miracles, all the amazing things that we see him do, the person that we know, nobody knew who this was. Only John. John came to prepare the way. So if John's there and he's still preparing the way, that means the way hasn't happened yet. Like Jesus hasn't made the way yet. He hasn't been who he was called to be yet. He hasn't worked a single miracle. He hasn't saved a single person. He hasn't taught anybody about the, the kingdom of God. He hasn't fulfilled like God's law yet. He is still just an ordinary 30-year-old man living out the call of God in his life. And yet God said, this is my son. I'm validating who he is. And I love him. I love him no matter what, and, and I'm going to affirm him because, because of, just because of who I am, not because of who he is, not because of what he's done. 
I affirm him because of who I am. I encourage him because of who I am. You do look like me. You are mine. You do reflect my greatness. And now that you know who you are, know that I love who you are. I love you as my son. You didn't have to earn it. I, I, I validate you. I, I called you mine. I called you out. I accepted you. The Bible says that he adopted us in. Adoption is a choice. Heather and I had a two-year plan. We got married in October. We got pregnant in December. We had a kid in September. That was not the two-year plan. We did not plan to have our first son. Did we love him? Yes. Did we choose him? No. Did I pick to have a boy first? No. Did I want a boy first? Absolutely. We walked in, and Heather was like, oh, she's moving around. We walked in to literally find out the gender, and she's saying she until the moment the lady put the thing on her belly and was like, that's a freaking boy. Let's go. I was pumped. But did I pick it? No. But in adoption, you go and you say, I want that one. I'm taking that one home. And then you pay a price for that child. Like, that's what God did for you. He said, I want them. I choose them. You are my son. You are my daughter. And I love you. And I accept you. He did the same thing for us. Hear me. Hear these words tonight. You're a child of God. God loves you. He is proud of you. Stop fixing your eyes on what you have or haven't done. It doesn't matter that God knew what Jesus was going to do. It's the fact that what Jesus had done up until that point meant nothing. And God said, I still love you. And I still accept you. Your father has affirmed you. Affirming to assert strongly and publicly. I love that. I love that God did this publicly. God didn't pull him away into the wilderness to tell him that he loved him. He called it out in front of everyone that was there. John had a massive following. Hundreds of people would have been there to watch John baptized that day. And God called him out publicly. It says to declare one's support for, to uphold, to defend, to offer someone emotional support and encouragement. A mother can encourage you, but a father affirms you. Your father has affirmed you. Your father has accepted you. Romans 8, 31 through 39 says, nothing can separate us from God's love. What shall we say about such wonderful things as this? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Our pastor says, who cares who's against us? And he, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give up ever, or give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, not even you, for God himself has given us the right standing with himself. He gave it because of who he is. Who then will condemn us? No one, not even me. Say, not even me. Not even me. Not even I can condemn myself for Christ. Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. He is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. I love that picture. Every morning when I get up and I pray, I picture myself in the throne room of God and I picture Jesus pleading on my behalf. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, pleading on our behalf. Can anything ever separate us from God's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or we are persecuted or we are hungry or we are destitute or we are in danger, threatened with death, if we are single, if we don't get the job that we want, if we didn't graduate when we wanted to graduate, if we didn't receive the thing we wanted to receive, if we didn't get into the relationship that we wanted to get in, if we didn't have the title that we wanted to have, if somebody hurt us, can any of that separate us? Does any of that mean he no longer loves us. As the scriptures say, for your sake we're killed every day and being slaughtered like sheep. But no, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That love that was revealed when Jesus was baptized and he said, this is my son and I love him and I accept him and I affirm him and I'm proud of him. That same love that was revealed to Christ is revealed to us through his life, is revealed to us through the price that he paid. That even as much as God loved him, he was willing to give him up. Even after he had done all the things that we know make him great, even after he had, he had, 
fulfilled the call of God on his life, God was still willing to allow him to go to a cross and die and pay a price for us. And we read this verse, and we are dumb enough to think that we can mess it up. Like, is that insane? Have you thought about that? Like, I am dumb enough to read this entire chapter in Romans 8 and say, God, I just don't feel like I measure up. God, I just, I feel like you're not going to forgive me for that thing. I feel like you're not going to forgive me for what happened to me or what they did to me or what I did to them or the grudge that I've held. I don't know if I can forgive them. Or we begin to hold these things against ourselves and think that we're the exception to the rule. We think that we're the one, the, the, the one thing that can separate us from the love of God is what we've done, what's been done to us, what we said, the grudge we held, the fact that we didn't spend time with God, the fact that we haven't been as consistent as we want to be, the fact that we went out and did something we weren't supposed to do, the fact that we hooked up with that person we know we shouldn't have, the fact that we ran with the crowd that we knew we shouldn't have been hanging out with, the fact that we were in the place that we knew we shouldn't have been, doing the thing we shouldn't have done, whatever that is. Think that we don't deserve God's love, that we don't deserve to be used by God. That's ridiculous. I say all the time at work when somebody does something dumb, I say, you big dumb idiot. I think I just called an intern a big dumb idiot tonight. I apologize, whoever that was. I think it sounds funny. I, don't, I, I, don't, I, mean, it's, I mean no offense by it. Like, I'd, if I call you a big dumb idiot, I'm sorry. It's just like my lingo for like you shouldn't have done that or whatever. I remember uh, I work in a factory after... Uh, after Bible school, I call it pre-Bible school was my BC days, my before Christ days, and then maybe like my first year too. And then I, and then I graduated Bible school and I was living for God. And then I went to like a wilderness phase where like I thought I was going to be on staff at a church and I wasn't, so I was working in a factory. And uh, I remember working in that factory with a couple of homeschool kids, no offense, uh, homeschoolers. You'll know why I said that in a minute. One, one of my best friends is working next to me and then my homeschool buddy. Uh, and uh, we're working and, and I remember I called him a butt face. Literally, it was a joke. It's like the funniest thing a third grader could call another third grader, and it popped in my head, and he did something dumb, and I called him a butt face, and we were joking around, we are laughing, and this kid next to me, uh, who may or may not have been homeschooled, got so fat, like, you could see the offense, like, wash over him, and I'm like, what, I'm like, dude, what, my bad, like, what, what is that about, and he's like, well, the Bible says to not call a man a fool, and I was like, well, I didn't call him a fool, I called him a butt face, so I think I'm good, um, but we are dumb enough big dumb idiots, to think that we could mess it up. All right, I'm going to continue in this story. Here's what I love about the word. This is why we should read the word in context, because if we continue to read, we just heard God call out these things about Jesus. You're my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. I'm proud of you. And then it goes on in the next verse, chapter 4, verse 1. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit. The moment after this happened, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness, we're going to come back to that, to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and for 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. That's an understatement. Uh, I can't skip lunch and not be hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, Satan begins to, the enemy begins to quote scripture to him now. He will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, and you won't even strike your foot on a stone. And Jesus replied, The scriptures also say, You must not test the Lord your God, and next the devil took him to the peak of, the, of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and said, I will give it all to you if you kneel down and worship me. And Jesus said, get out of here, Satan, for the scriptures say you must, not, or you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil went away, and the angels came to take care of Jesus. I think it's easy for me to look at this story and be like, yeah, but it was Jesus. Like, the devil's never come to, like, personally tempt me. And so whether he did or didn't with Jesus, like, it doesn't matter because it's Jesus, right? But you have to remember, like, this is Jesus before having done a miracle, before having seen the work of God flow through his hands, 
before having seen the work of God like flow out of his mouth, before he ever spoke a healing word or a word of life over anyone, Jesus goes and he's like, I've got to, I've got to fulfill the call of God on my life. It is time. He gets baptized. He hears, he hears this amazing word from God. He goes out. He's led by the Spirit of God. He begins to fast and pray. He's weak. He's tired. He's hungry. And Satan begins to say all of these things to him. Hey, listen, you're hungry. Just eat. God wouldn't want you to starve, right? Like, what did you come here for? Didn't you come here to rule and reign? Just, just bow down to me, and I'll give you everything you came to earth for. You don't have to die. You don't have to pass through the cross to get everything that you came here for. You don't have to go the hard way to achieve what you were called to achieve. I can give that to you. That's exactly what the world does to us. Listen, I can give you everything you want. I can give you joy. I can give you peace. I can make you wealthy. I can... I can I can give you that. I can give you what you seek out of the word. And it's so much easier if you do it my way. It doesn't have to be hard. Satan comes immediately to steal the seed. What's the first thing God said? This is my son. What's the first thing the enemy said? If you are the son of God. What's the first word we ever hear the enemy speak in Genesis? Did God really say? If God really said that. And Jesus, or Satan comes the exact same way at Jesus. If you really are the son of God. He goes on, and the, and the second time he tempts Jesus, he said, he will order his angels to protect you. What's the second thing God said? Whom I, whom I love, right? If he really loves you, he will protect you, don't you think? If God really loved you, you can jump off, and he's got to protect you, right? Because he loves you. He told you that. Does he love you or not? Jump off and prove it. He hasn't proven his love to you. What has he done for you? Jump off. Let's see it. Let's see if God really loves you. And he combats it with the word. I'll give it all to you. With whom I am well pleased. If God is really pleased with you, wouldn't he have given you something to prove that? What has he given you? What do you have? Because I've got it all. All these kingdoms, everything you see, all of these people that you see, this is all mine. And I'll give it all to you. You want to show somebody that's pleased with you? Bow down and I'll be pleased with you. Watch what I can give you. Satan came to steal the, the exact word that God had just spoken over his life. Remember when I said insecurity breeds infidelity? Had Jesus not been secure in who he was and whose he was, it would have been very easy for him to be unfaithful in this moment. For him to turn away from what God had called him to do. You know what? I am really hungry. You know what? He did say, he did say that he would provide for me. He did say that he loved me. Maybe I, sh maybe I should test that. You know what? He, he did say that, that he was proud of me, and, and I do deserve this. I do deserve, I haven't sinned. I'm 30 years old. I've never sinned. All these people are amazed every time I go to the temple because of the way that I teach. Like, I've earned something, right? Had Jesus not been secure in who he was, it would have been very easy for him to be unfaithful in this moment. But Jesus knew that confidence breeds covenant. Confidence breeds covenant. I am confident in my relationship with my wife, and I'm confident in the covenant that we've made with one another because I know that, that I am a man of God, and she is a woman of God, and we have come together and made a covenant that we're going to be faithful to one another. And I can be confident in that. Insecurity says, I don't know if, if I can trust her. Insecurity says, I don't know if I can trust me. Insecurity says, I don't know if I can allow her to love those parts of me. I don't know if I can allow her to get to know that side of me. I don't know if I can let her in on that. Confidence says, I know that she's going to accept me for who I am. I know that she's going to love me no matter what. I know that when I slip up, she's going to look at me and say, hey, that's not the man of God that I married. You're better than that. Confidence breeds covenant. I trust my father. It's easy to be faithful because I trust his promises. Despite my current situation, I'm hungry and I'm tired and I haven't accomplished anything yet, but I know who I am. I know what God has called me to be. I know my worth. I know my value. This is about value. You have to recognize the value that God placed on your life. Something is only as valuable as the price that somebody will pay for it, right? Right? Like shoes drop for $220. Well, guess what? That's not what they're valued at because the moment they drop, all of a sudden they double. It's worth whatever you'll pay for it. Right? Like, that's your value. Well, guess what? Jesus gave everything for you. You are valuable, and God loves you. You have to see your, valuable, your value. Ladies, you have to realize that you're more valuable than what your body has to offer. You're more valuable than the words that they speak over you. 
fellas, you're more, you're more valuable than just what you have to offer or how you look in the mirror or how much money you make or what title you have or what degree you get. Like, you're more valuable than that. Realize your worth. Jesus realized his worth. He wouldn't allow the enemy to define him. He wouldn't allow the enemy to qualify his worth for him. Worship band, you can come on up. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days. Satan saw him at his weakest moment physically and came to tempt him. Satan saw his weakness, not his strength. He was fasting and praying and preparing for this very moment. He said, I don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that is all Jesus had digested in those 40 days was everything that came from the mouth of God. Jesus was more alive than ever. Jesus was stronger than ever in that moment. But Satan didn't see it the way that we, the way that God saw it, the way that Jesus saw it. Listen to how significant what Jesus did here is. Jesus was making right everything that man had failed at. The word calls Jesus the second Adam, the one true human being who comes to do what Adam was supposed to do all along, live in harmony in the presence of God. Jesus reconnected us with God. Speaking of, this isn't in my notes, but I want to make this comparison for you. Speaking of infidelity in the Old Testament, um, divorce was wrong. Right? The only way that you were permitted to divorce is if there was infidelity and the covenant was broken. Okay? Jesus, God compares us, his people, as his spouse many times. If you read the book of Haggai, the book of Habakkuk, they, they compare a wife to a husband and the wife is unfaithful. And the man of God comes to, to rescue her over and over and over and over again. And if someone was unfaithful and they got a divorce, that person could only be renewed and remarried if the other one was to die. That's the only way they can be released of that covenant, okay? God said, you're my spouse. Like, I, I love you. Like, God, God said, you're, you're my bride, my church. And all throughout history, his church has been unfaithful to him. And God said, I want to make this covenant right. You broke the covenant, but I want to make this right. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it by my law. And my law says we can only be brought back together if one of us dies. And I'm not going to sacrifice my bride. I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'll go. I'll pay the price. I'll renew the covenant. I'll make it right between us. I didn't do anything wrong, but it doesn't matter. I'll lay down my life to make sure that this covenant can be brought back together forever, that you could never break it again. It's perfect. We have a perfect covenant with God. Because Jesus paid the price. And now we're made right through Jesus. And Jesus never sinned. So now God sees his bride through the blood of Christ. He sees his bride through this perfect person that can never turn their back on him. That can never be unfaithful to him. He's given us confidence. He's given us love. He's accepted us. He's affirmed us. And he says, listen, you can never run away from me again. Because I'll always be here. You're my child and I love you. Jesus allows us to live in perfect harmony in the presence of God. Jesus was tempted by the devil, but unlike Adam, he was victorious over temptation. And instead of doing it in a garden, he went to the desert, symbolic of humanity's exile from the garden due to sin. God led the Israelites to the wilderness to prove their faithfulness to him, and they failed. But Jesus went into the wilderness and won back what was lost. Instead of eating from the knowledge of good and evil, he fasted feeding on the spirit of God and the power to defeat the devil. The devil comes at him in the same way that he did Adam and Eve, questioning the word of the one who created him, questioning the word of God. But Jesus' mind and mouth were full of scripture. And he knew who he was and he knew whose he was. And he didn't allow his current situation to define him. He didn't allow what he had or hadn't done to define him. He was confident in the covenant that God had made with him. He was confident that God was going to do exactly what he said he would do. 1 John 4 says this, and I'm wrapping up right now. I'm way over time. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize we are God's children because they don't know him. This is my son. This is my daughter. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. 
So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. And such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. That is the love that we live in now. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his love. If we are afraid for fear of punishment, it shows us that we are not experiencing the love of God. We are not experiencing the price that he paid for us. We are not living in the kingdom that he called us to live in. You're a child of God and he loves you. And he paid a price for you. Stop seeking your affirmation elsewhere. He's not going to give it to you. She's not going to give it to you. That title's not going to give it to you. That dollar amount's not going to give it to you. Whatever that is in your life that you're seeking to affirm you and tell you that you're doing okay and tell you that you're on the right path, Stop allowing that thing to define you. Allow the love of God to define you because he has called you out. Put your hope in Jesus, man. Know your worth. Jesus paid too high a price for you to feel unworthy.